Okay, Maitland. This, this is Maitland Smith um, from the university, the director of the Indian Law program, and a good friend for a bunch of years. So, so um, I'm actually on leave this year, so I'm actually not at the law school, although I'm giving you the contact information for the law school. Um, I have to do this disclaimer since we're now recording it that the presentation is my presentation. It doesn't belong to the law school. None of the views I express, and I will express views, I assure you, uh, are those of the law school or the university. So I just want to make that clear that I'm doing this based on 25 years of practice, uh, most of it having to do with Indian law and all of it. Um, all of it having to do with Indian law and a fair portion of it doing with the Indian Child Welfare Act. So a lot of what you guys were just talking about, I'm now going to tell you is totally different when you have an Indian child. So all those concerns you were raising, going to be a totally different uh, scenario when you have an Indian child. A and I think that is uh, probably the most important part I can make you guys realize is that um, it, there's going to be different standards here. This is going to deal, the Indian Child Welfare Act deals both with voluntary and involuntary assimilation. That was what it was designed to try and halt. And it was looking at um, the impact of removing Indian children from Indian communities and Indian families. <coughs> because without those children, tribes can't pass on their language, they can't pass on their culture, they can't pass on their stories, their spirituality. That all ceased to exist. And uh, when we look at the statistics, we'll see that that was a problem. So the whole purpose behind the Indian Child Welfare Act is this type of assimilation should only occur if the tribes and the families want it to. And, and so you have a different sort of hierarchy when you deal with an Indian child than you do with non-Indian children. So why you're going to see a whole bunch of different standards. I'm going to tell you that right up front when you've got Indian children. And why do we have those different standards? And the main reason we have this is because of a whole pattern of past practices and policies that the United States implemented towards the Indian people and, and the, the devastating effect of those. So here's some historical background. Um, we all know of the forced migration of tribes from the East Coast primarily to the West and from the West Coast into the center. So you have this whole federal policy of removing tribes from their homelands and placing them elsewhere. And part of those practices were specifically directed towards their children as well. Uh, starting as early as 1832, but continuing even up until the early, well actually to the late 60s, there were federal policies out there what, that were designed to remove Indian children from their families and place them in non-Indian homes or non-Indian settings if they were not a home setting, such as in boarding schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ask you a question about the, I see you have up there that it's displacing American Indians. That's right. Does this Indian Child Welfare Act pertain to people living here but are from a Canadian tribe? Okay, well, see, that's sort of, um, I'd have to say yes and no. Because as we know, those are artificial borders for a lot of the tribes, both on the western, I mean both on the, the southern boundary and on the northern boundary. So for example, here in Montana, the Blackfeet tribe, the border goes right through their aboriginal homelands. A and the Blackfeet nation has got the, the tribes in Canada and the tribes in the U.S. The Confederacy views all of that as part of the whole tribe, the Blackfeet Confederacy. Now, where, and I don't know if you were involved in that case we had, Dennis, or not, but I actually had a case where Dad was Canadian Blackfeet. He was part of the um, Sitka, Sitka tribe of the Blackfeet uh, nation. Mom was Crow. Um, the, the state kept arguing, well, this isn't an Indian child because the child was not a member of Crow. She wasn't eligible for enrollment. They didn't view her as a member. We couldn't get the, the Blackfeet nation, Browning, to say that they recognized the child. But Sitka in Canada said, yes, she is a member of our tribe. And, and so I was actually representing the father in that case. And I argued that because 
Tsiktika is part of the Blackfeet Confederacy, Confederacy, which is part of the Blackfeet Nation, which is recognized here in the United States, that this was an Indian child. The state, of course, said, no, it isn't. Judge Larson in that case actually said, I'm going to view this as an Indian child. I don't care if maybe technically it's not. It, it basically, I think the child has connections to various tribes, Blackfeet, uh, Crow, and we found out later Northern Cheyenne as well. So that's sort of a case of the state social worker not making a thorough determination of the child's heritage because there's a possibility she could have been enrolled at Northern Cheyenne or a member of Northern Cheyenne all along. Uh, so so those, are, those are huge issues. And you also have like Rocky Boy has a, has a sister band in Canada. A lot of the High Line tribes on the High Line have those Canadian counterparts. And you have the same situation in the, in the South. Obviously, we don't deal with that as much here, but you have the same situation where you have tribal communities that have been split by this artificial border in areas that historically, I mean, they've been there from time immemorial as a phrase. So, so that becomes an issue when you're looking at whether this is an Indian child. And as CASA workers, you, you can take a position on that and it, as to whether this child should be treated as an Indian child. Um, so I think that's something you need to look at. Um, sort of going back to this federal policy, tribes viewed a lot of these federal policies that were in place as significant enough that they were actually <coughs> creating genocide. They were losing uh, tribes, total tribes were just disappearing, but then they were losing crucial parts of their tribal culture as well. And that sort of leads up to the uh, boarding school air, and that began, like I said, it was in full force in the late 18th, uh, excuse me, late 19th and 20th century. And so how many of you know of Richard Pratt? Okay, so Richard Pratt is from the, he started the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. It's probably one of the most famous one. And uh, he had approached the government for funding for the school after the Civil War. He was, he was a uh, military um, officer in the Civil War. And he approached the government to fund this um, experiment, maybe it's not quite the word I want, but it really was an experiment, of taking Indian children and putting them in this boarding school that was run like a military school. In, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And so his philosophy was to kill the Indian in the, in the child to save the man. And, and that, that sort of starts this whole boarding school air of um, taking away, you know, making them cut their hair, making them dress in military style uniforms, not letting them speak their language, not letting them practice any of their, their traditional spirituality, their tribal customs and traditions as part of the boarding school training them to be domestics or um, uh, you know, laborers as far as like farming, mechanics, so simple laborers, and then um, farming them out in the summer to non-Indian families as part of the outing process. And so this, this became the model for a lot of the boarding schools. Now I'm sure you also know that a lot of the boarding schools were run by religious denominations. If you've listened to the news at all, we have the religious denominations and the um, lawsuits that have been filed in recent years because of the both physical and sexual abuse in particular that had occurred at the boarding schools. So this is the legacy of education for a lot of Indian families. And I, I start with this because you're going to see that this is going to color an Indian family's um, willingness to work with what they view as a state system. They haven't had real good results with working with state systems. So when you're talking about building that trust, you have another hurdle here of trust when you're working with Indian families that you're going to have to uh, overcome in order to be effective when you work with them. The other thing that I think it's important to keep in mind is because you have this um, policy of, of uh, taking, removing the children and disrupting the parenting process when they are small children, children as young as four were taken, actually probably even you know, as young as three, were taken to these boy, boarding schools and often kept till they were 18. Sometimes with not even being able to visit, depending on how far away the boarding school was. So, so you have 
the um, parenting that is normally, that acculturation process that's normally passed on to children, that what they were learning for parenting styles were militaristic boarding school styles. So, so the parenting skills that you would normally le learn in a family setting may not have been occurring to the same degree for your Indian children that are part of boarding schools. And so you have this, this um, pattern of Indian children being in boarding schools, particularly during those formative years, that are not learning parenting skills that, that, that maybe are um, as good, for lack of better words, as what you would, would expect in a family setting that has caused disruption in those families. So that's this historical trauma that you may hear about when you're working with Indian families that you have to be aware of that they are, um, they are dealing with a lot of disruptions in their lives for, for generation upon generation. And trying to break that with one case is just not going to happen. It is a generational problem that's going to take a couple of generations to try and resolve as well. When, when did that, maybe you're going to get to this, when did that boarding school era sort of end? Well, there are still boarding schools today, so it has not totally ended. The difference is now is the focus of the boarding schools are not at um, eliminating tribal culture, but now have moved towards preservation of tribal culture. And right, and they're voluntary, exactly. So that's, that's the big difference. Voluntary in the sense, um, I, I guess I have to sort of qualify that there are some areas, and I use Navajo, for example, because of the vastness of the reservation and the road condition of the roads at Navajo, some of those boarding schools, the kids go to the boarding school and stay there because they, they can't access it during the winter months if they don't stay there. So to meet that educational requirement, they have to board. But it is, it is voluntary to the extent that um, they're, they're not being forcibly removed now and um, the focus is not on assimilation, it's more on cultural preservation. So starting in 1832, 51 boarding schools were in place. This is sort of that beginning of that, that boarding school era. It sort of hit its peak um, in, the, in the early 1900s. Uh, there were, uh, were 300 and, I mean, 383 federally operated schools. And just look at that percentage of kids that are there. These are all kids that you can bet then were not uh, being taught parenting skills where you have a nurturing nuclear family. You, you, they were going to be more of the military or um, religious denomination type schools. And of those, uh, 156 were actually boarding schools. So I think the closest boarding school probably to us is Chamawa in Oregon right now. And, and this, this statistic I will tell you is probably about three years old, I think is the last time I actually looked. Uh, I was doing some research on, on Indian education. And at that time, there were 40 tribally or federally controlled boarding schools. So some of the boarding schools are run by tribes now, as opposed to uh, Bureau of Indian, uh, actually it's Bureau of Indian Education would be what they'd be under. If you're interested in more of this boarding school, next week, next Wednesday, um, this, there's a speaker here, Dr. Brinder Child. She's going to be at the university at the Payne Family Native American Center speaking on the boarding school and the effect of boarding schools on Indian families. I just let you know that in case anybody's interested. I don't know if you're doing your training next week or not, but if, if you're not, that's an option. I don't know whether they're recording it or not. In addition to the boarding school, then beginning in the 50s, the federal government had a policy, it was the Indian Adoption Project, where the whole purpose of this program was to take Indian children and place them in non-Indian families. And I guess I should be clear, it was, it was white families. So it wasn't just non-Indian, it was just, it was white with white parents. Were these kids that were just unilaterally removed or they had been orphaned or? Well, you know, um, no, they had not been orphaned. Uh, no, I mean, not necessarily. The rights may have got terminated, but these were kids that tribal, not, and let me, the tribal in this sense was, most, was the BIA social services, not tribal department social services. BIA social services felt um, should be, or could be, maybe even is a better, removed from their families and placed for adoption. So that's where they would encourage these Indian families 
to place their children for adoption uh, in, in, with, white, with white families. Um, so out of that, um, that, that project, there were only 395 Indian children that ended up being placed with that. But, um, but, but the impact, or the, the sort of the impact of this policy would have been far greater if tribes had not stepped in and said, we need to halt it. And often they're gonna be removed for poverty conditions. That was generally the reason that they were being removed, is for poverty. So another, another person, um, she taught last fall, she was here. Um, I guess it must have been in October because it was when I was doing the training last time. Susan Harness has written a book. She is a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe. She was one of the children that was adopted under the Indian Adoption Project to a white family in Great Falls. And it's a, it's a pretty interesting book. I will tell you it's a really expensive book. So see if the library has it. I keep hoping it'll come down, but it's still like $100 for the book. So, um, uh, you know, you might want to see if the library's got it or the university library probably has it as well. But she is an example of the Indian Adoption Project. And it's, it's, it's very interesting the impact that has had on her. And she's now, she has now been re reunited with her Indian family um, up on Flathead, but uh, it did leave some, uh, uh, it impacted her, I guess I will say. Um, that was the presentation last year. I forgot to take this slide, sl slide out. So here are the statistics prior to the adoption of the Indian Child Welfare Act in California. 92.5% of Indian children that were removed were placed with non-Indian families. And when I say non-Indian families, almost always these were, were white families. Um, and based on the uh, information at that time, one-third of all Indian children were removed from their, from their families prior to, the, prior to the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act. So think about that. If a third of our children were removed as the United States and placed in China, Russia, who I don't know, someplace else, I, th I think as a, as a sovereign entity, the United States would be somewhat concerned about that. And tribes were equally concerned about it. Uh, Minnesota and Montana, South Dakota and Washington, uh, the range was from five to 19 that of what non-Indian children were. Um, the overall national rate was anywhere from 2.4 in New Mexico to 22.4 in South Dakota. South Dakota probably isn't still much better. And Montana's still not much better, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. When you guys were talking about removal of children, almost all of these children were removed because of what they viewed as neglect. They were not removed because of abuse. But when you say they, Mm -hmm. State. These is all. These are all removals by the state. So it's not BIA because at this time the tribes were sovereign nations. The tribes have always been sovereign nations. Right. So, so why is what's going on with? I would be interested to, to mm -hmm. know what's going on with the tribes that they're. And I'm going to use the phrase was letting mm -hmm. happen. Okay. So what's going on with the tribes that they're letting this happen is the BIA was running their social services, not the tribes. And state social workers were coming into reservations and removing children. And, and they, they, didn't have, they didn't have resources to address that. They didn't have, most of them didn't have tribal legal departments at this time. Most of them did not have the infrastructure that they have now to address it. And um, then you have your urban Indian populations. Right. So, so they're sovereign nations, but they don't have the wherewithal of a nation. Well, they don't have the legal department. The they, well, a lot of them did not at that time. Well, this is what you have to keep in mind. Is, and I don't think, to be honest with you, it's that much different than, than the states. What are the two biggest budgets for the state of Montana? DPHS and education. And, and so when you're talking about tribes who have very few resources that they can actually access because they don't have the same, they can't tax, they're, they're limited in how they can generate revenues, they are limited in, in what they can do to try and halt this. But part of the problem was, was, was the state social workers illegally going onto reservations and removing kids too.
Well, and they were literally just like showing up and taking them, right? It's not like they had, you know, pre-planned this or gone through separate steps to do this. Weren't they just showing up and taking them? So, so, well, I mean, yeah, social workers were coming in because they were saying they were operating under the, um, I guess, assumption that they had jurisdiction any place in the state, even on reservations. And, and so, yeah, it was, but, but there again, no, yeah, nobody, they, they tribes could not, did not have the resources to sort of halt that when it was occurring other than to go to Congress and say we need additional funds or we need some type of, of legislation. So that's, that's sort of the history that leads up to the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act for sure. And when you say ur ur uh, urban Indian, do you mean uh, Indians that uh, are affiliated with the tribe that live off the reservation? Well, they're affiliated with the tribe, but they live like in Missoula or Great Falls or Billings, so they live off the reservation. So, you know, urban in Montana, is is sort of a loose term because because I would consider them urban Indians if they're in even Glendive it's sort of any Indian that's off the reservation that would would uh, be under the state's jurisdiction for most things um, the, the, we have the Indian Child Welfare Act that then changes that so it's any Indian that's not on a reservation or what's called Indian country if there's not a reservation so so these kids are not being removed because of physical abuse they're being removed because of what would be termed as neglect. And so um, one of the things that, that when we're talking about neglect, one of the things that I think um, frequently kids were being removed for is this idea that they'd been abandoned by their parents because grandparents may have been raising them or an auntie or an uncle or even some friend of the family. So there's a wide extended family network in Indian country. And, and the Indian children may be one week with one auntie and the next week with another auntie and two weeks with grandma and then back with mom and dad. So it's much more fluid family within Indian country as to who is supposed to be caring for that child. And that's perfectly common. It's not, not thought anything of in Indian country. You never know which niece, nephew you're going to have living with you at any one time. But the state social workers saw that as abandonment by the parents and were often removing these kids for that reason. So that, that was part of the grounds often used for it is that neglect that they said uh, was the basis for the removal. Um, and then other grounds that we used was, was alcohol, substance abuse issues that they, they were removing Indian kids because of substance abuse issues, which um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with if, in fact, they were removing the non-Indian kids at the same rate. So what you saw is Indian kids being removed for substance abuse, but non-Indian kids where there was substance abuse in the family, they were not being removed. So you had a different standard there for kids being removed uh, from Indian families. Um. So, whoops, the Montana pre-statistics um, are that they were at thir that Indian children were removed at 13 times greater than the non-Indian uh, rate. I'd like to tell you that that's improved, but last time, and I meant to bring that, I was over there on a hearing three weeks ago, and the department, I think they said, I want to say 33% of the kids in foster care are Indian kids. It's in the 30s range. Don't hold me to the 33, but I know it's in the 30% range, um, which was higher than it was before it was enacted. So I'm not sure that it was totally solved what we hoped it would, but that's the current thing. So in 78, um, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act. And this is, this was, at that time, this was one of the only pieces of legislation that tribes actually asked for. There are four volumes of Title 25 of the U.S. Code. Out of those four volumes, this was one statute that tribes actually asked for. So it was very important to tribes. I just have to uh, emphasize that, that uh, this is something tribes actually wanted as opposed to most of the statutes that were sort of imposed on them. And what the, the statute primarily does is it recognizes that tribes have an interest in their children. And it was a way of protecting the tribal children 
from um, the states coming in and removing them because of a, a lack of understanding about tribal cultures. And what it did is it gave tribal courts as the preference for handling these matters. So when you guys talk about best interest of the kids that I heard you talking about before, when you have an Indian child, it's always in the Indian child's best interest to comply with the Indian Child Welfare Act. Montana Supreme Court has said that. That's what the whole purpose of the act is. So, well, this sounds, I think I know the answer, but so if the act establishes exclu exclusive tribal jurisdiction, how do we ever get a case? Okay, well, um, th th it's a preference, though. It's a preference for exclusive but, tribal jurisdiction. But how do we get a case, then? Okay, so, so it's con we're going to see. It's concurrent jurisdiction between the tribe and the state when the child is domiciled or residing off the reservation. Okay. Once it's concurrent jurisdiction, then normally it's going to be the state court that has it. But if the tribal court wanted it, they could... That's right. And the tribal... That, well, you would think. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's the preference of the statute. That's what they're talking about. That preference is, is if the tribe wants that case, they ask for it, and they should get it. So, Dennis, how many cases have you seen transferred? Zero. I've, wow. seen, I've seen two in the last 25 years. And how aren't they getting transferred then? Do you have any ideas? Is it because they're not asking, or is it because... No, they ask. It's because the state courts aren't actually transferring it. Really? Yeah, I, 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 it's, um, I think probably, I mean, not all of them. But not, they don't ask all the time. They may intervene and not ask to transfer. But I would say probably of the cases in the state court, I'm going to guess, well, I, I guess I, I shouldn't make that guess. I think that there is probably at least 40% that they ask to transfer to the tribal court. Um, just based on the number of cases I've had, um, in every case I've had, at some point we've asked to transfer. So who actually asks for this transfer? So, so the parents can ask. We'll, we'll, we'll show that, but I don't mind jumping ahead. So um, the, the parents ask. The parents can ask for the transfer. The tribe can ask for the, pan, for the transfer. And then we're going to see, when you're dealing with an Indian child, you can have somebody called an Indian custodian. They can also ask for a transfer. Is this in addition to the, the attorney that's assigned to the child? So there's an Indian custodian and a child? Well, the, the Indian custodian doesn't mean the same thing that I think you're thinking of here. It's not, it's not, it's, it's the equivalent of a parent. Okay. Great. Yes, so, no, it was not. Yeah, I mean, you were going, you were going more guardian ad litem. Right. From a custodian, custodian type thing. But that's what I'm saying. You have a different, you have a different category here when you're when you're talking about who has an interest in this child so remember when I was talking about that extended family and right. uh, as an auntie I, you know you, you may have the child if the child is removed from somebody other than the parents that person may have not always but may have what's called any custodial status and they're going to be treated just like a parent in these proceedings then the, just then that's just recognizing the the more fluid nature of family in your tribal communities. Um, and, and the other part of this was that uh, they wanted to set the minimum standards for how these cases were going to be handled. Now, as I always say, all the statute says is these are the minimum standards. I will tell you the state views that as the maximum standards has been my experience. You don't usually get them to do anything beyond what the act requires. So for all practical purposes, the state agencies are viewing those as the maximum standards. For some reason, this keeps counting off the top part. Um, so the sta the, you, when we talk about those standards, somebody had talked about uh, for removal, the standards for removal, those evidence, evidentiary standards, I don't remember over there was talking oh, about those. Yeah. yeah, they're different when you have an Indian child. So you have different standards here. And the reason that they have different standards is they felt that that was needed to protect the best interest of the Indian child. So um, here are the other provisions of it. The security and, and uh, stability and security of the tribes and family. That's that preservation of culture. 
And the other thing the act was supposed to do, and I think the act has totally failed on this last one, is to assist the tribes. We were talking about why have they let them go. And it was basically to assist the tribes in getting those funds to operate their own programs. The, the federal government has not been very helpful for the most part in providing those services or those funds for services to tribes. So as a, uh, there are still a fair number of tribes here in Montana that the BIA is a social service department. It's not a tribal social service department. So here are the, the general requirements from the act, and this is where the standards are different from it. We've talked about that exclusive tribal jurisdiction. So if you have an Indian child that is a resident of the reservation, the, the term they use is domiciled, then the tribe has exclusive jurisdiction. So, for example, if you have a child on the top of Everett Hill, you're on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Reservation, but you're also still in Missoula County. And somebody could call Missoula County and say, we, have, we want to report an incident here. But if that is an Indian child, the tribe has exclusive jurisdiction there. Now, I'm gonna, I have to say this because the way the act reads, it's over any Indian child. The Confederated States of the Tribe may say, we're only going to take jurisdiction if it's a tribal member child. So they may not, they may, and they may not. Um, it sort of depends on how flush they feel in funding as to how broad they're going to exercise that jurisdiction. So uh, they do not have to, if their code says that they're limited to tribal member children, then they don't have to take jurisdiction over uh, non-member Indian children. And well, uh, can you just real quickly mm -hmm. explain the difference between, I mean, it, so, so what you're talking about is that they live on Evero Hill and they're a uh, crow. Right. Then they're not a member of the Salish tribe. So. That's right. So you may have somebody that they're enrolled at Crow, they're an enrolled member at Crow, but mom or dad is a member of the Salish and Kootenai tribe, but the child happens to be enrolled at Crow. The tribe may say, we're not going to take jurisdiction in this because they're not in a room. They may, because they do say we'll take first generation. But they may not. Um, and, and so and it, it all comes back to funding. It's not because they don't want to exercise that jurisdiction. It's all a funding issue for tribes, just so like for any state government. So does it automatically then go to the... It would go to Missoula County then. Okay. Yep. The other thing that this act does is it requires the states and tribes to recognize each other's orders. So um, normally tribes and states don't have to recognize each other's orders. They, they're considered foreign nations and they don't have to recognize each other's orders automatically like, like states do. But this act says that states and tribes will in fact recognize each other's orders. It also requires that the tribe be given notice. As CASA workers, this is something that you can help make sure happens correctly, because I don't think it always does. Um, I've had more than one case where there wasn't a determination made that this was an Indian child until we were several months into the proceedings. And I'm sure you've seen some of those too, Dennis. If a CASA worker, as a CASA worker, you come in, one of the first questions you can ask is, is this an Indian child? Is this child a member of any tribe? Is this child have any connection in any way to an Indian tribe? And if they do, say if you get anything that indicates yes, you can make an inquiry then if it's not in, the, in your information on the, your file on the, on the child, whether the tribe has been given notice of this. This is a requirement under the act that the tribe be given notice that there is one of their children that is in the state system. Is there a particular form this notice has to Yes. Be yeah, there is. The statute lays that out. You guys aren't going to have to be doing that. That's what the county attorney's office has to do. So you don't need to know that. You can look. The statute tells you. And it's fairly simple. It's just what any kind of good notice is going to do. It's going to tell you, you know, what the child is removed from, where the child was removed, what the child was removed for, what the time of the hearing is, what are the consequences if they do nothing about this. And it's the same notice that goes to the tribe as it goes to the parents or the Indian custodian. But if you don't do that, this action can be found invalid. And it, it's, you know, do it right from the beginning and you're going to solve a lot of problems. Are you going to explain what constitutes a member, a... 
I, and that's, you know, that's actually a very simple thing. Really? It is. You wouldn't think it is, but it really is for ICWA. Now, not in other areas, but for ICWA. The tribe determines that. Okay, but how do we know? You don't. And that's my point. You don't. So you don't, get, you don't get to make that determination. If you have any inkling that this is an Indian child in any way, shape, or form, you have to notify every tribe where this child could possibly be a member. And that could be, that could be notifying, you know, Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Blackfeet, Flathead. You can't just call and ask if they're registered or, I mean, there was no... No, you have to give them notice. <laughs> they have to give them notice. So if the parents are saying, well, you know, yeah, they're some tribe in Canada, but, we, you know, we don't really care. We're just going to go through the court system. Are you free and clear or do you still... You know, I would say no. Just to be safe. Well, but I mean, it's really to protect the kid. It is. So, so I mean, if they say they may be in Canada, you would need to say you would need to determine if there's any connection with the tribe here in 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 Montana, primarily. Although it could be any place in the United States. It doesn't have to be just a Montana tribe. It's any tribe throughout the United States. So you really need to check that. So you have, a, I mean, when you get in the, the Northeast, you have the Mohawk, the Seneca, um, the Oneida, that all have Canadian counterparts. There's another one where the border is right there. So if it's children here in a tribe in Arizona, mm -hmm. I have to contact the tribe in Arizona? Okay, you don't actually have to contact them, but they have to be given notice. Okay. And but that's... We don't give them, we don't give them notice. No, I'm just saying you can check to make sure that that notice has been given. Okay. So, because often you may be developing better relationships with these families right. than the caseworkers. I, I see that quite frequently. And so the family may say something to you that you think, wait a minute, did they just say that they have relatives down in Navajo? Mm -hmm. Do I need to check this out further? And so then when you ask questions, you find out, well, yeah, you know, they, their grandmother, their father or whatever is enrolled at Navajo or is a member of Navajo. And there's, that's not showing up any place. That needs, you need to notify the, the county um, and let them know that because they have to be given notice. And that has happened on occasion where a CASA has spurred CFS <laughs> to notify the tribe. Right, and that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm saying you guys actually can be a crucial component to this is that you may get that information just because you're asking the right questions and they maybe haven't. Or they trust you more than they, they trust the caseworkers. Um, so, so I think that um, you have an opportunity to help get compliance with the act. Uh, and one of the ways is to make sure that proper notice has been given, both to the tribes and, like I said, it has to go to the, the parents and the Indian custodian as well. The other thing is um, that the parent in here is Indian custodian, and that's what I'm talking about, is this, this other individual who is an equivalent of, um, of a parent within tribal communities that they also have a right to court-appointed counsel. Now, it used to be that this was different than what the state required. As, uh, as Dennis was talking, now you don't have to worry. They have attorneys for everybody and their dog, I think, in these hearings these days. So I'm not sure that you really have to worry about this now, but they, that used to be different, that the state did not have that. Who appoints the Indian custodian? Is it a family member, or is it uh, an established person for the tribe for a year or two, maybe? And I'm sorry, what? And who, who assigns the, the custodian? Oh, uh, no, that's what I'm saying. This is a family. It's, it's not usually done by the court because then you have a court order. These are these informal extended family relationships that you have. So somebody that steps up? Well, it, it may not even be, it's, it's, see, it's not like somebody's stepping up. It's just that you may have kids for a couple weeks that are your nephews or family friends or something. It's, it's a very informal relationship, but... When you've got the kids, you know you're responsible for them. But she's asking about the custodian. The but that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what it does. It, yeah, it can shift. It's just it's just somebody that has primary or has parenting duties, I guess, for lack of better term. In with for one right. child in one case, could we have a parent <coughs> and an aunt who's a custodian yes. both be participating because they both share care over the child? That's right. Yeah, so can you can. multiple custodians step up? I'm sorry, what? Can multiple custodians step up? You can. Um, and, and so you'll often see that where, you'll often see this with, and I use aunties, because it's often aunties and grandmas, that they may sort of be sharing those parental responsibilities. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it's you know with the with the parents' consent. So are you saying <coughs> that they go to court? They could have all these folks go to court, and they could all have their own attorneys. Attorney. They they could. Uh, I don't think you're normally not. To be honest with you, you're probably not normally going to see that because the family's probably going to say this is the person we view as the primary person. But you, you easily could, depending on the arrangement. I mean, I don't want to say it's outside the realm of possibilities just because of the nature of how families work. I know of um, our neighbor, um, their, their one daughter uh, was going to school in Ronan, and so she was living with an aunt and uncle out there during the weekdays, but coming home on the weekends. Uh, and so during the weekdays, I would have considered the, the aunt and uncle to be the, the Indian custodian. And there was nothing formal done about that. You mentioned consent mm -hmm. by the parents. So the parents have to say that it's OK that they be the custodian? Uh, um, I would say no. There doesn't have to be a formal consent. That's what I'm saying. It's not, all these formal things that you so want in the state system just don't happen in Indian country. Yeah, but I mean, I understand, but it's like they're, they're not, you're not going to see those kind of things for the most part. You may see, you may, uh, if you're lucky, see a piece of paper that sort of says for purposes of getting them enrolled in school or something, they say I give temporary guardianship, but you probably are not going to even see that. It's much more informal than that. Um. And the other, the other difference uh, that you see when you have an Indian child is the state has to make active efforts to reunify the children with the parent or Indian custodian. So you have reasonable efforts under the state. I'm and sorry, I'm just laughing because it says Indian family. And I'm like, but who's, after what you just said, I'm yeah. like, but who's family? Right, well, I mean, that's just it. They, but it's, it's sort of, really what they could say is Indian community, yeah. because that really is what it more is, is to protect that Indian community. But the, 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 um, the, the issue is, is that the, the state has to make active efforts to make sure that that, or try and make sure that that child is returned to the Indian family. Active and reasonable, what's the? Well, higher standard again. But what, what, so, what would it look like? Well, and we'll, we'll talk about this more, but active efforts are more than just saying, here's your reunification plan, these are things you need to do. Which is what you often see as reasonable efforts. Identifying where the problems are, identifying what steps a family has to take to correct those problems. Active efforts means you have to get them the bus ticket to go to the treatment program, and you have to make sure that the treatment program is actually going to meet their needs, I would argue cultural needs as well. They may need to have a bus pass to make appointments around town. They may need um, some educational services. So they, they have to actively engage in finding services and making sure the family is participating in those services. And you have higher evidence for both removal and termination of parental rights. And in addition to those higher standards, you also have to have the testimony of a qualified expert witness. So you were talking about social workers and you know, when they try and qualify them as experts. Mm -hmm. Social workers are not qualified expert witnesses for this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the qualified expert witness, if you go to the guidelines for it, now, and we'll look at this a little bit later. The, the, there are very specific things that this person should know. The first and foremost is that they should have knowledge of the child rearing practices of that child's tribe. Is is the, the first preference for that qualified expert witness. Has this been um, updated? for lack of a better term. There have never been any changes made to the Indian Child Welfare Act. Okay, so, so even though there's been a number of changes within the tribal communities, not all, but mm -hmm. there's been significant changes. Um, within the, so, because what I'm looking at is, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, so basically the state is doing this and has this obligation, mostly, <coughs> 
and, and I'd be interested to know why the state has decided they don't want to give up jurisdiction, right? When yeah. the tribe here in this scenario has said, we don't want jurisdiction, this child, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but, but it's still, so, so what is, are the tribes contributing anything in that kind of a scenario to the state to help with this process? No. And the reason that they're not is the state gets funding for these Indian kids because they claim them. So, so really the argument is... Is that the reason they don't give up jurisdiction? Well, we're going to get to that. There is that aspect of it. I'm not going to say that's totally it. I'd like to not be quite that cynical. We've heard that rumor before. But, but... Um, From another speaker. Yeah, but... but um, I, I mean, I truly do think... and Well, I, I just think a lot of it, to be honest with you, is a lack of, um, they don't feel comfortable with the tribal courts because they really don't interact enough with the tribal courts to feel comfortable with them, is really what I often think it is. It's sort of like I think they'd almost be equally hesitant maybe to send them to Washington, but they have to because of, of the way the federal statutes, I mean, they don't, have that, they don't have that ability to resist as much between states as they do between tribes. So I just think it's a lack of familiarity with the tribal court systems. So, so how much is the tribe actually stepping up and actually taking these cases? Um, you know, they're, they're going to vary from tribe to tribe. And it, I, it, I, I have to go, it's a resource issue. So tribes with more resources are going to intervene, at the very least, in every case. So I think you'll find at Flathead, they intervene in every case that they get notice of. They may not ask to transfer, but they certainly intervene in every case. Not all tribes are going to do that. So Northern Cheyenne probably doesn't do that because they don't have the in-house counsel to do that and they don't have the resources. So it's, it's, it's always a resource issue. If tribes had unlimited resources, they would be intervening in every one of these cases and would be actively moving to transfer because they could provide the services. But often they can't provide the services either because they just don't have the funds to do that. So it sounds almost like a situation where you'd get into that push and shove thing where oh. It doesn't where, have to. Well, but it, I guess what I'm, what I'm meaning with that is that, okay, so if Missoula continues to take that case, then they have to pay for everything mm -hmm. to make this case happen and for, for the Indian custodian or the parents to have the attorneys appointed and paid for and all the transportation and everything else paid for. And so in one sense, that helps the tribe who doesn't have the funding. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the tribe now doesn't have input into that as, as at the same level. Right, well, so they could. yeah. Well, they can, they can intervene. And I always tell every tribe to intervene because that's the only way they can help ensure compliance with the act. Oh, absolutely. But, but there again, it's always a resource issue for tribes. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it's not so hard for them to intervene here in Montana, but you're thinking of somebody said, you know, there was a tribe in Arizona that you had involved. Think about the tribe in Arizona, uh, maybe not Navajo, because Navajo is one of the wealthier tribes. <laughs> yeah, that said, but I mean, think of some of the smaller tribes, so whether it's Pasayaki, although I think they may, because of gaming, be better off now, but some of your smaller tribes that don't have those resources. Um, to have to come to Montana, to, to, to the hearing in Montana. And, and they, they just can't when they can use those resources maybe to take cases in Arizona. So it always comes down to a resource. So it's like any government where you're going to put your Isn't resources. Is always going to kind of keep that shift to where there's more Native American children being put in white? Well, not if they follow the act, and we haven't got to that yet, okay. but, but <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be a push, uh, but, but um, it can be, for sure. So first off, I guess we need to, to make clear that this only applies to Indian child custody proceedings in your state courts. So the Indian Child Welfare Act does not apply to custody proceedings in your tribal courts. It's only for those state custody proceedings involving an Indian child. That's the way the act is written. Right, but if, if we were in tribal court, we wouldn't be there. You wouldn't be there, no. exactly. So we wouldn't be there. Um, yeah. yeah, you wouldn't. <laughs> so, so you're not going to be there. So, so the, the things that are, the, the, 
the things that are custody proceedings, state custody proceedings, are going to be your foster care, and, and that's certainly something you guys can be involved in. And it's going to be termination of parental rights is a, as state custody, pre-adoptive placement, and adoptive placement. Now, this is both the involuntary termination of parental rights and voluntary termination of parental rights. So both of those. You guys, I think, are primarily involuntary is what... I, I don't. Do you have anywhere they're voluntary? Yeah, we um, yeah, well, a, a, a few rel relinquish. Yeah. yeah. But but they, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily consider those totally voluntary in the sense that the statute means. I mean, they may choose to do that, but that's usually because the kids have been removed. It's not truly that. There's never been. It wasn't um, their idea. Right. It wasn't how they started the proceedings that they wanted to to terminate their parental rights. That may have been where they ended up thinking, but that may not have been their starting point. It does not include delinquents, juvenile delinquents matters. And I don't, although there was one that, I, I didn't think you guys got involved in juvenile delinquency, but there was one that you were talking about that I wasn't sure. Well, I mean, we, we, are, we have cases where they are involved, but it's not, well, I, yeah, we are. Yeah, so that's what I mean. I mean, I'd say again, it's probably it probably doesn't. You guys don't start out with them as that way, but the kid may commit some delinquent act that, that then you guys get sucked into. It's not the reason you get involved. Yeah, so it it does not um, it it does not apply to those situations, and it also doesn't apply to dissolution proceedings. But you guys don't ever get involved in dissolution proceedings, do you? What's dissolution like? The divorce. Yeah. yeah your divorce proceedings. So those are areas that it, it does not apply to expressly. So then we talked about who's an Indian child. So here's the actual statutory definition of who it is. Um, and it's a member of, of the Indian tribe or eligible for membership and the biological child of a member of the tribe. But there again, like I said, it's actually very easy. The tribe makes that determination. And the percentage of Indian blood depends on the tribe. That's right. Some tribes don't have a percentage. Right. Can yeah. you encounter a situation where you got, say, two Indians that are eligible mm -hmm. for membership or members, and they have left the reservation, they're living in Missoula, they have no interest in Indian culture, and their child is taken away from them and becomes uh, act, uh, eligible for this, that's right. this act, even though parents don't want That's right. And that's because... In addition to the parents having an interest in a child, that sovereign entity has an interest in the child. So parents may not care, but that doesn't mean that the tribe isn't interested in that child. Because their, their goal is preservation of culture. That's where the philosophical people have to That's right. I mean, that is, I mean, that is the, where you get that big parental rights versus tribal rights. And, and um, that's why I try and take it in the context of... If, you, if we were taking a third of our children and putting them in China, don't you think the United States would have some interest in that? Yeah, the the, the controversy this? sometimes mostly comes up not when the Indian, you know, or they're, they're active in the, the tribe, and even though they're off the reservation, you know, they want the kids. They're, not, that's gonna, they're gonna have much more, but this is more like when they don't want the kids. Right, yeah. right. yeah no, this is where, yeah, you do, where they say, I don't want to have anything to do with that tribe, I don't want to transfer, and it's like, so That's right. So your goal should always be to try and unite them with the parent or Indian custodian, as the as as the, as the first one. The, but the right, well, the, yeah, because they they have the primary. But if the Indian custodian or the parent is not appropriate, then the goal is to preserve that tribal culture. Okay. And, and so, really. Um, what what the state courts do, the case on this is a riffle case in Montana, uh, and what the Montana Supreme Court has said, uh, that the tribe determines membership. Once the tribe, once we have a letter from the tribe saying this child is a member, that's all we need. We don't care what the BIA says. We don't care what the family says. It's a tribal determination. No source, no appeal for that? That, that didn't go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was that this amount. There's no avenue of appeal for that decision. Well, the avenue of appeal would have been the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't say that. But there's no avenue of, dis, of appeal for the decision by the tribe that a child is, a, is a eligible no. under ICWA. No. It's final. No, it's final. That is a final so determination. If they decide that my child is a member of the tribe, and I would have no way to challenge it. Well, um, 
The only way you could challenge that is if it didn't meet any of the requirements under their code. Okay. I mean, they have to follow their code. Okay. So there is some appeal on the reservoir in, within the tribe. Yeah, so well, I guess in that since you go, there's an appellate process. All the tribes have an appellate process. Okay. But I, from the state, I thought you were talking about the state decision. No, I didn't no. I mean, you always can appeal a decision from a tribe through the tribal process, whether it's an administrative process or through the court system. You, you have that. But, but once you've reached, you've exhausted those tribal remedies, it's not going to go any further. Uh, so then we talked about the concurrent tribal and state. We've sort of already done that. And um, that the exclusive tribal jurisdiction if the child is resi residing there. So uh, I'm not going to go back over that unless you guys have additional questions. Um, the, the only other thing I want to, to talk about is we've talked about the domiciled. But there's another scenario that you guys actually may run up against. And um, if the child is actually a ward of the tribal court and ends up in the state system, the tribal court still has exclusive jurisdiction. And that, you actually may run into that, uh, where you have a child that's a ward of a tribal court. Uh, and then once these are dismissed, uh, the, the, I mean, once it's been transferred, then the state court proceeding is dismissed and you guys are done. So here, you were asking about the notice requirement. Here are the notice uh, that you have to give and what the specific requirements are. But there again, you guys are not giving this notice. But if you've got a child, an Indian child, you better make sure there's a notice like this in your file someplace. And the right to intervene. So we've talked about that the tribe can intervene, and the Indian custodian and the parents are obviously already a party, so they don't have to intervene. Um, now, I guess I have to raise this because this is the case currently before the U.S. Supreme Court that they haven't decided on. If you have an unwed parent, uh, they actually, I think some states make that unwed parent be an intervening party. I don't know what Montana would do on that, to be honest with you. Uh, this case is out of uh, South Carolina. But the, the unwed father actually had to intervene in the case. And he's appealing that? He's not appealing. What, what's it it was, uh, the adoptive family is appealing it. It was a non-Indian family. Yeah. And so, so um, the non-Indian family is the one appealing it. The child was placed with the father uh, in, that ma in that case. And um, again, our tribes, I think, always need to intervene. The other thing to keep in mind is they can intervene at any point in the proceedings, so it's really nice if they are intervening right at the beginning, but sometimes tribes aren't. And sometimes it's because they didn't get notice early, or sometimes it's because they were fine with what was happening in the state court up until the point where they said, we're terminating parental rights and placing the child. And then they're like, well, we're not fine anymore with this. And they can intervene at that point, or at any point in the proceedings. So transferring, um, the, when you transfer, both the parents can ask for transfer of the proceeding, the Indian custodian can, and the child's tribe can ask for a transfer of the proceedings. Um, either parent can also object to that transfer. So it's not automatically going to happen. Where you often see an objection is where you have, um, well, there's a couple scenarios, where you have a non-Indian parent and an Indian parent, or whether you have two Indian parents but are from different tribes. And the tribe that they're going to be transferring it to isn't the tribe of the, of the parent that's objecting. So um, the, the, you do that. Tribal courts can also decline to take jurisdiction. The state courts can say, do you want to take jurisdiction in this case? And tribal courts can decline that. Are there cases to where the parents are strong or full members of one specific tribe but different from each other and both of those tribes have yes. different opinions on what should happen with the child? Yes. So you actually, that happens more than you think, the dueling tribes. Um, so, so frequently, because the, you know, tribes are so mobile, that you often see that, and I, you know, I'm not dissing any, any tribe, but you often see this with Crow and one of the other tribes. And part of it is because of the clan structure at Crow. They have different, different um, cultural practices than some of the other tribes do. And, and so you have different views on 
who should have jurisdiction, who the child should go with, whether they're uh, millennial, a matriarchal um, society or a patriarchal society. So, so you do have some differences uh, based on um, how the, the tribe's cultural structure. So if I have two parents now, one and they're not married, mm -hmm. but they have children together, and it's mentioned that they're tribal, mm -hmm. or not tribal, they're, they're Indian. Okay. But they don't connect themselves to the tribe, they don't want to pursue anything with the tribe, don't give notice, don't do anything. Oh no, you still have to give notice. Still have to give notice. Yep. So it still has to go through that process. Yep. The parents, parent or parents still have to say, no, we don't want you. In they can, the, no, the tribe always has a right to intervene if they are members. That's right. They, they just don't, they just cannot object to the transferring. They can't object to the intervention. Okay. But so they can object to the transfer. Okay. So they can say, no, we want it kept in state court. Okay. And, and I think. Because they object doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. No. Right. No, if a parent objects, it stays in state court. Oh, so it's okay. Right. It's in All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if the parent objects. They still be involved if they choose to be involved. Right. But the, the tribe can still be a part of the case. There's still an intervening party. Uh, the child can if they're over the age of 12. But the judge cannot. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, the, ju I mean, the, the judge doesn't have to object. They just right. find some reason not to. <laughs> it, what they're going to, I mean, we're, we'll get to that. But what the judge is going to do is they're going to find, the term is good cause. They're going to find good cause not to transfer. And, and, you know, I may quibble about whether it truly is good cause or not uh, when I see some of the reasons that they've used. Has it ever happened that two tribes have both wanted yes. jurisdiction? Yes, it and, does. And how was that decided? Well, you know, it, th there's a formula for doing that as well. And so the, the, this is where I, I don't envy the tribal, I mean the state courts, because actually that is a state court. The state court has to determine which tribe the child has the most contact with. Yeah, and that can be, that can be a challenge, because they can have virtually 50-50 with both tribes. Sometimes you'll get the tribes to agree as to which tribe it should, but not always. Um, and it just sort of depends. I mean, this is where you get into that historical rivalry between tribes. They may be more likely to do that if it's a tribe outside of um, sort of their geographical homelands where they weren't historically in, in battle with them at various occasions. But if uh, it's between, say, Northern Cheyenne and Crow, they might just because of the interaction there, but Crow and Blackfeet, probably not. They're both going to say, we, we, want, we both want jurisdiction. So, so those, those happen more than you think. Um, it's, yeah. Did somebody else have a question? I, I think you already covered this, uh, so I apologize. But uh, if the tribe isn't given notice mm -hmm. and, it all, and it goes all the way through and somebody gets you know, uh, rights to the child or whatever, and then the tribe finds, finds out, is it completely, they start from scratch? Yep, you have to go back. You're supposed to go back to square one then. Okay. Yeah, that's why, I mean, all these, all these really horrible cases, I mean, the South Carolina case that has been made, that's part of the reason is they knew that this child was Indian and didn't give, they, they had the information wrong. So they, had the, they didn't spell the dad's name right and had, they had his birth date right when they asked the tribe to see if he was a member. And the tribe said, no, based on the information you've given us, we don't show him as a member. And then when they got the right information, they said, oh wait, he is a member of our tribe. But they, they knew all along that this was an Indian child and they didn't go through the steps that you're supposed to go through when you have an Indian child. And, and all, the only person that loses in these cases is a kid. And I've had more than one case where I've been representing the kid of the tribe where the kid is a true loser in these cases because there's just non-compliance. And that's why I say as CASA workers, you do have the, the ability to try and make sure that doesn't happen by safeguarding some of these procedural things that the act puts in place to protect that tribal culture. We've talked about um, why does the state just transfer these? Why don't they just always transfer it? And I will tell you, I don't understand most of the time why they don't just transfer it. But they don't, and what they, well, no, because if it's funding, I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking when the tribe is declining. 
I'm talking about when the tribes ask to it and they're willing to accept it and the state won't transfer it. Oh, okay. And they don't have to if they can show good cause not to. And so what's that, what is that good cause not to transfer? And there again you have to go to the guidelines which the Montana Supreme Court say apply even though they're just guidelines. And these are the circumstances under the guidelines when you don't have to transfer. So if it's an advanced stage of the proceedings, um, and you know, it may be an advanced stage of the proceedings because the tribe hasn't gotten notice until an advanced stage of the proceedings. So some of these I just think are, are not um, a good basis for not transferring it. Uh, and, and then the other one is if the child is over the age of 12 and objects, which that's a different age than what you see in the state. Most of the time in the state it's 14. Uh, and it's 12 under the Indian Child Welfare Act. And then the other one is, one of the other ones is the evidence that's necessary for deciding the case uh, would be a hardship for the state social workers, the state case management workers, uh, CASA workers or whatever to come and uh, present in the tribal setting. Um, now, I, I, I can understand that to some extent, but I know there was a case out of Nebraska where the Nebraska state court refused to transfer it to the tribal court in South Dakota b based on this when mileage wise it was 50 miles from the state court to the tribal court. Now maybe in Nebraska 50 miles is a lot <laughs> but here in Montana 50 miles is nothing. So I, I, I think that they often use things um, that really are not legitimate and, and that's an example of one of the times that I sort of thought really you're using you know that the N on the Nebraska helm, football helm stands for, don't you? <laughs> do I want to know knowledge, knowledge yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and the other the other time uh, although I will tell you I've never seen this last one and maybe you can speak to Dennis if you have I've never seen this last one ever used that if the child is over the age of five and the parents aren't available and the child has had no contact with the tribe then they don't have to transfer it. I've actually never seen this one used in Montana. Um, so, so I, you know, that's I think uh, to the uh, kudos to the state courts for not using that one. One of the things that the act or the guidelines specifically say is social economic conditions and perceived inadequacies of the tribal court do not constitute good cause. Uh, and, and you know, they're never going to say that that's the reason they're doing it, but I truly do think for a lot of these judges it's just that they don't feel comfortable with the tribal courts because they're not familiar with tribal courts. I think if they built relationships, it's very interesting because I do quite a bit of work with Fort Peck and the uh, tribal judge at Fort Peck has a pretty good relationship with some of the county district judges up in that area and, and I, they, they transfer the cases much more readily to his court as a result of that. So those relationships I think are, are really crucial to facilitating that transfer. So after that jurisdiction is determined and then you have to determine whether those requirements have been met for removal of the Indian child from the Indian family. <coughs> And this is where we start on the standards of evidence that are required. So um, the qualified expert witness and the type of evidence that's needed. Emergency removals always are handled differently and I don't know how many of them you get as a, that start out as emergency removals. Not very many, none. So, so I'll just briefly tell you, any social worker regardless of where they are can always remove a child if it's an emergency situation. If that child is in immediate harm, danger of harm, uh, that child can be removed by any social worker and you sort out the jurisdiction things later. And that's really what the emergency removal says is they can remove it. If you determine that it's the tribe that should have jurisdiction, you just immediately transfer that case to the tribe and vice versa. If the tribe removes a child and it's a state, they transfer it to the state. Um, so when they do that, they're supposed to petition that uh, petition is supposed to include an affidavit that contains the following information. The circumstances that led to the emergency removal and um, the need for the removal. 
and what actions were taken prior to that removal to uh, those are those active efforts. What actions were taken to try and make sure that the child was safe without having to remove the child? So now we have the standards. We've talked about uh, the standard under the state being um, preponderance of the evidence for removal for a non-Indian child. Here you have clear and convincing evidence. The reason they have a higher standard in this statute is because of the failure to have legitimate reasons for removing Indian children historically. And so when they passed this act in, in 78, they put this higher standard in there. And as one tribal attorney said, so maybe there actually will be, um, uh, the, the, the lower standard will be met, actually, if you put clear and convincing here. So, the, you know, really, preponderance of the evidence um, is really what they were sort of hoping that, to achieve, that there really was something more than we just don't think the parents are, are they, the parents have abandonment or there's neglect here. There's got to be something more than that. So that's the real reason for having that higher standard is just because of the basis that were being used for removal and not understanding those cultural standards and those cultural differences. So the clear and convincing is, is a cultural protection issue. It doesn't mean that the child has to be more abused, more neglected for the child to be removed. It just means that you have to have clear and convincing evidence that this child is abused or neglected. And um, we're going to see that you have to have the um, qualified expert witness to testify to that. And those both were put in there as a protection for the tribal culture to sort of address that previous act of removing kids where they really did not have a legitimate basis. The kids were not in harm. So it's, it's not looking at the clear abuse issues because you're going to get those easily for clear and convincing if there's abuse. Is the qualified expert often a tribal member? It's supposed to be a tribal okay. member. Um, it's supposed to be a tribal member of that child's tribe. And we'll look at the qualifications for that as well. <clears throat> um, so the other thing to keep in mind is evidence that just shows poverty conditions, crowded or inadequate housing, alcohol abuse, or non-conforming social behavior does not con constitute clear and convincing evidence. Again, that's put in there to address those bases that were being used historically to remove these kids. So qualified expert witness, for some reason it's cutting all of these off. I think when I change the formatting, when I change my, all my formatting. So here's the person that's going to qualify as that expert witness. And as you'll see, the first person is that person that's a member of the child's tribe. But the important part is it's got to be more than just a person that's a member. They've got to be recognized by the tribe. So it can't just be anybody that's a member of that tribe. It's got to be somebody the tribe recognizes as knowledgeable about tribal customs and traditions and child rearing practices. Is there a list of, of people of the tribe saying these are people we would fill meet this category? You know, just like uh, <laughs> people that, you know, there are people who make a living as, as you know, expert um, witnesses. And I'm sure there's a list of lawyers passed around saying, hey, if you got, you know, if you want to figure out economic viability, right. this is a good guy. And, uh, so so let, me, let me think how to answer this. So if you are um, working cooperatively with a tribe, the tribe is probably going to be inclined to tell you who that person is. If you have been not as helpful to that tribe as that tribe might want, you may have some difficulty in getting that information. Well, I'm, I'm not interested in getting the information. I guess what I'm saying is, is there's if, no if list. There's a, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it they say they recognize, it says here that the, the, the tribe is recognized by the community. Mm -hmm. And I, well, I guess what, I'm, what mm -hmm. my understanding of the word recognize is that. You know, you're recognized mm -hmm. by something. You're given a little form piece of paper no. saying, no. "We no. recognize that you have this training, you have these skills, you have these abilities," no. and so that you can't just throw Uncle Bubba in there at the last minute and say, "Yeah, yeah, we give you." No, it's not. It's not. It's not anywhere and, and near who that. Is the tribe? So the tribe is going to be. Um, well, it's going to be several things. You're going to work with, if they have an ICWA department, some tribes have an ICWA department, that's who you're going to be working with. It's going to be your social work department. It can be your cultural committees. So ever who the tribe has designated as the person to make that determination is who you're going to have to go to. There's never any, uh, never any um, 
I guess, disagreements within the tribe about now. You know. Of course there is. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that's, it's <laughs> open when, you know, like when one says, yeah, this guy, and the other person in the tribe says, no. Like, you don't see anything like that. Well, well, no, once, I mean, if the tribal council or if the tribal council has designated the social service department will make that determination, or sometimes they'll designate that the tribal court makes that determination. Whoever the tribal court makes, may, decides, or the social service or cultural committee makes, the, the tribe's going to support that because that's consistent with their policy on it. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be disagreement right, right. over it, just like with any expert witness. Well, not official disagreement. Right, it's not going to be from the tribal, you know, um, official authority line, but certainly the, the parents may disagree, the state may disagree. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, but you're not even seeing that for the most part. The state has people that they've identified as expert witnesses that they bring in that often are not even members of the child's tribe. So when you're saying that it may be difficult to determine who that person is, mm -hmm. Right, like so, like you know, termination is uh, impending, <laughs> and the tribe doesn't agree. Right. And so that child's attorney is requesting, or state attorney is requesting that we have that person, and the tribe's kind of saying, "Good for you." Good. I'm glad you're making that request. And yeah. <laughs> then does the state? Can the state make them? Get nope. Them? Or how, nope, the so state has to. No, the state has to come up with a qualified expert witness. Okay. And so if the tribe won't provide one, the state has to find one. And I'm going to tell you right now that tribes aren't big on termination of parental rights, almost uniformly. That's, that's not something tribes. That they're fine if you do long term placement, custodian, guardianships. They're not big on termination of parental rights. And they're also not big on closed adoptions. And in the state system, closed adoptions are really what you've got. So, so the tribe is often not going to be very cooperative because okay. they don't agree with those policies. So in reality, though, mm -hmm. the tribe doesn't take jurisdiction of this. The judge is going to make, the state judge is going to make a decision on whether somebody is a qualified expert witness or not. Right. So they get somebody who's not a member of the tribe, but da -da -da, the state judge blesses them and says, yes, you're a qualified expert witness. Well, I mean, the tribe hasn't intervened. They didn't take jurisdiction. Well, so they're not going to appeal that. Uh, but yeah, but suppose the tribe has intervened. They're just not providing the name of an expert witness. Okay, so they still, they intervened. They didn't provide the name of the expert witness, and the judge said. And I, as, a, as an attorney representing the tribe, I'm going to challenge that expert witness. Tell me about the child rearing practices of that tribe. What do you know? And I've had people testify that were from Crow testifying about Blackfeet. Um, and, and I didn't I didn't challenge it there because the father was not actively involved and I was representing the father but I have challenged it where the tribe was actively involved they did not have somebody as a qualified expert witness that met anywhere met any of these requirements and we kept telling them that or at least the first one. well the first one yeah yeah thankfully none of this will be stuff that we you don't have to that's right <laughs> Yeah, no, you guys don't have to do any of that. But I'm just saying these are requirements that the burden's on the state. It's not on the tribe. So um, the, the other one is substantial experience in delivery of family service to Indians. So that's where they get these the, the second group that you're talking about in. But again, I'm going to say, and do you know what the prevailing social and custody standards and child rearing practices within this Indian child's tribe are? So, so when, when they have somebody at Blackfeet testifying about the Celeste tribe, which is a coastal tribe in Oregon, I'm going to say, really? Do you really know about their customary, customary practices for child rearing? What's your basis for saying you know? How or are you going to... Do the tribes differ in how they raise their children? And if you're going to get to that, just ignore me. But I no, I mean, it varies from tribe to tribe. It's very different. It, like I said, it depends on whether you've got clans, it depends on whether you're matriarchal, patriarchal. There's a lot of difference between child rearing practices of tribes. Okay. The, I think you'd find even on Flathead, there's differences between Kootenai and Salish. Okay. So, so I, I think that you're going to find a variety of differences, whether you have Plains tribes, coastal tribes. Um, there's a lot of difference. Pueblos are going to be very different than, than your Plains tribes. 
Um, so, so that you know, as an attorney, when I am looking at representing either the child or the tribe or even the parents, I'm going to have to raise that to to effectively represent my client. It kind of uh, it kind of speaks to some of the issues that you know the Indians have is that there is so much diversity. That's right. right. So that the, you know, you can't you you speak of Indian, you're not speaking of one group of right. There isn't a pan Indian yeah. issue here. Um, it, it really is. Each tribe is very different, um, and, and like I said, Crow is going to be very different than than Salish Kootenai. But it's within our best interest. Not that we're going to have any say about it. Mm -hmm. But I would think that if we're looking at this, and in our best judgment, removal is. You know, everything's been looked at. Da da da. da. We're at a place where we're supporting or we're saying, okay, removal, and see, that's what CPS wants, that to, to not have disruption to the child, that the, the, it's in the child's best interest to make sure the state is actually living up to the standard. That's okay. right. If your goal is best interest of the child, and the Montana Supreme Court it says compliance with, act, with the act is in the best interest, as, as CASA workers, you may be the one saying, wait, is this really the social work, I mean, is this really the expert witness you want for this case? With substantial educational experience, those are usually your doctors that are testifying, and and that's that's fine. You know, you have doctors to testify. They're not testifying to culture things. They're usually testifying on medical things, psychological. So so that's that last category there. Um, and you know, I'm not going to necessarily quibble with those, unless they're so totally off base. We have obvious, obvious evidence of child of physical. That's right. We have broken bones here. I'm testifying on that. Yep. No, you still need that. Okay, you still but need but. But that they, there's somebody that can testify as to the to, as part of that expert witness to the, the the damage to the child. They're one piece of it, but you still are probably going to need somebody in this one, unless the the the, the medical um, is so severe that really right because at some point. Yeah, I mean, I, and I've had cases like that where not culturally acceptable right to break your children's bones. Right, so I mean, yeah. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but preferably that child still stays in the tribe with the tribe. Right. right. That's a whole different issue than the placement issue. So, so that's a different. So um, normally your social workers are not unless they have some additional training, experience, affiliation that's going to put them up into one of those other categories. So active efforts. Here are some of the specific requirements when we talked about active efforts. I'll just breeze through these quickly. Um, again, you always have to look at what the uh, cultural conditions and social conditions are within the child's tribe. And look at the available resources to that extended family. What programs are available uh, that can assist the family for that. And uh, what treatment programs are being offered. Let's look at termination of parental rights because this is another area where you have deviation from what you have in the state system. First off, we're going to look at the involuntary because that's primarily what you guys are going to be dealing with. It's beyond a reasonable doubt is a standard here. And again, qualified expert witness, serious emotional or physical damage. And, and usually, there again, the challenges are not going to come with the physical damage. The challenges are usually going to come where they're alleging serious emotional. And if that really is serious emotional or if there are cultural things that are being misinterpreted here and, and really are not the problem that the state thinks they are. So it's almost always going to be in that emotional category rather than the physical where you get these challenges. So um, for termination, if you have a voluntary termination, and I'll use that term loosely, um, for it to be valid, these are steps that absolutely have to occur under the Act. It has to be executed in writing before a judge of a court of competent jurisdiction. That means either a district court judge or a tribal court judge. Those are the only ones that are competent, have competent jurisdiction to take that, um, that voluntary termination. The judge has to certify that the terms and consequences of the consent were fully explained and understood by the parent or the Indian custodian. You'd think this is a no-brainer, but I've seen judges not do that. If English is not their first language, it has to be done in their first language. 
So Crow, for example, still has a fair number of fluent speakers where Crow is their first language. It would have to be done in Crow to them. Cannot be given within 10 days of birth. That's different than the state. And it's void if it is. And if the baby's left at a hospital or something, is this overridden by that? Well, that, that opens up a whole different category. Because generally, if the baby's left, 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 you have no way of knowing the heritage. And, and um, we, we've had numerous discussions on that as to whether they then uh, automatically need to treat that child as an Indian child until they know differently, which is be what I would actually recommend to the state to do so that they don't get into it down the road and find out, in fact, it is an Indian child. Um, but that's a whole different scenario. Because they're not, giving, they're not giving the consent in the traditional form. That's under a different statute totally under the state. Um, and it can be withdrawn by the parent. But how long? Well, that's, oh. <laughs> that's what we're going to look at. Um, so they can be, if it's a foster care placement, um, they can withdraw the child. They can withdraw that consent and the child has to be returned to them unless the state can come in and meet all those standards for not. And in voluntary proceedings for termination, the consent may be withdrawn at any, for any reason at any time prior to the entry of the final decree of termination or adoption. So it sort of depends on that time frame at. Okay, so it could be a while actually on that. So here's um, sort of a checklist. This comes from, uh, I don't know if you've told them about the, the NARF, Native American Rights Fund, has a whole book on the Indian Child Welfare Act. This is one of their flow charts from that on how you do that. You can get that online, it's free. So now this is the real kicker where you guys are incredibly important, is the placement preferences. And again, what do you see in here? Absence of good cause to the contrary. So unless there's some good cause, and there again, I think it needs to be a legitimate good cause, the Indian child is supposed to be placed with a member of the Indian child's extended family. That can be either an Indian extended family or a non-Indian extended family. It makes no distinction there. A foster home licensed by the tribe, by the child's tribe. An, an Indian foster home licensed by the state, usually which the state tells me they have a lack of continuously, or an institution approved by the Indian tribe and operated under an Indian organization. So that's for foster care, where those children are supposed to be placed. Same thing basically for adoptive, absent good cause to the contrary, for the placement preferences. This is where we always run into problems. Same thing, member of the child's extended family, member of the child's tribe, other that, that don't necessarily um, extended family, or other Indian families. The other Indian families are supposed to occur after a national search. I have absolutely never seen the state do a national search. Um, reasons for modifying that. And the first one is that the biological parents request that. So the biological parents can request that. The child can also request it if there's sufficient age. It doesn't tell you what sufficient age is. I would argue that it's 12 because that's what they use for the transfer jurisdiction for other objections in the statute. So I would make the argument that it would be 12 for this as well. Extraordinary physical or emotional needs of the child is established by the testimony of an expert witness, qualified expert witness. Um, this is very, going to be in Montana, this is going to be fairly narrowly looked at. So I had a case where they were trying to argue that the child should not be placed with the maternal aunt and uncle um, because the child had bonded with the foster family even though the maternal aunt and uncle had come forward when the child was four months old and said, we'll take the child. You know, we want, to, we want the child placed with us. Um, and the state was arguing that the child had bonded with the foster family 
And the Montana Supreme Court said, you know what? No, you caused this problem by not following the placement preferences. You needed the foster care placement or when they moved to termination with the, the uh, adoption placement. So no, you can't use that. And any, any physical needs of the child can certainly be met by the uh, extended foster care family. I mean extended family because they were a licensed foster care family for the state of Oregon for special needs children, lived in the Portland area. And they said, we certainly think that any medical needs of that child can be met by the Portland area. So Montana is, is looking at this fairly narrowly, that it really does have to be extraordinary in order for that to, to avoid those placement preferences. <coughs> if there are no families available after that, diligent, after that diligent search has occurred, then you don't have to. But again, that's that national search that they're supposed to do. If the state doesn't want to follow that, it's their burden to show why they shouldn't. <coughs> and here's the placement preferences for, um, for the Indian child. The, the only other thing that I don't think will come up much, but it could come up occasionally. If the tribe has a different placement order in their tribal code, state courts are supposed to follow that. So for example, Fort Peck tribe here does have a different placement order in that they do separate out extended family, first preference going to Indian extended family, second preference going to non-Indian extended family. So technically the state courts should be following that if they have a child from Fort Peck. I know they don't, but they should be under the statute. And I shouldn't say that. I, I, the Missoula courts, I've never seen do that. The, the, courts around, the state courts around Fort Peck may actually know that and do that. Um, spatial placement considerations that need to come in to play are there again that's a different uh, order under the tribe but it's still the best interest least restrictive of it um, and then again the Indian child or the parents preferences need to be considered as well and if the parent is asking for anonymity the court can use that as a reason to avoid the placement preferences but I will tell you, the Montana Supreme Court has said they can only do that if there's no way that they can maintain anonymity and still meet the pl placement preferences. If they can meet those placements preferences without identifying the parent, they still have to follow them. Uh, the social cultural standards for that. And there again, it's basically looking at the prevailing social and cultural standards of the Indian community that they reside in. And here's just some statistics that I uh, always think it's good to keep in mind. And here are some, I think, um, hints, suggestions, perhaps, in working with Indian families. Uh, you really have to work with the extended family. You just can't work with the immediate family to be effective. Uh, uh, in most circumstances, there's going to be exceptions. These are, there's always exceptions to everything. But generally, there's going to be extended family involvement on some level. Um, contact with the extended family is almost always going to be in the best interest of the Indian child, there again, there may be severe dysfunction in that where it wouldn't be, but there's probably some extended family out there that the child should be able to maintain contact with. Uh, that, like we've already talked about that different in parenting issue. And uh, extended family, both an asset and a liability here when you're working with them. So if you don't, if you irritate the extended family, the case is probably gonna be really difficult to progress. In, a, in, in compliance with the act in particular, whereas if you can build a relationship of um, understanding and trust with that family, things will go a lot smoother. Is there something in the Native American culture that um, 
you know, in some cultures you only speak to the maternal side. Well, <laughs> Other cultures only to the paternal side. Is there something in the Native American culture that, that would show them respect in doing in their initial contact with them? Well, um, uh, there again, it, that varies from tribe to tribe. So some tribes are matriarchal. The Indian grandmas in those, those tribes, incredibly important to get those Indian grandmas on board if you want anything to really happen. If you're looking at some of the tribes that are paternal, that isn't who you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at the grandfathers or uncles or somebody else in that in that scenario who you need to be referring to. Uh, I, I think one of the best things you can do is listen. Actually listen to them. The yeah, I mean, and it's, it's going to come out as to who you need to include in there. I can't tell you the number of family group conferences I've been at where they've either tried to exclude Indian grandmas in particular because sometimes Indian grandmas aren't a lot of fun to work with because they are very vocal about very good advocates for their children, their grandchildren, whatever, and they don't mind telling you what they think you should be doing. And would it be offensive to just ask in your initial contact with the family? No, I th that's what I'm saying. I think that is, say, is there anybody else you want to include in there? Now, you have to be careful because of confidentiality issues. So you, you're probably going to have to have some waivers that they sign, that they agree that you can talk to these people, but identify with the parents who they want included, who they want information, who it's okay to give information to or get information from. Um, and and uh, it, there's, there's more of a cooperative um, if, you can, if you can create a cooperative relationship among all the parties, you're going to be able, you're going to advance the case a lot further. I think. Mm -hmm. so confidentiality forms. So even though there is no forms on the other side, we obviously still have to follow all our things. So when it comes to confidentiality forms, that will go through everything outside the nuclear family. That's uncles. Well, we can collect related. information from whoever we want, but we is my understanding. But that's we right. can't share. That's like right. Sharing, yeah. What, right. Which is just like when I asked earlier in training, like if dad is asking if mom's making it to her AA meetings, you can't. That's not my. Right. So if yeah. grandma is asking what mom said or what mom right. did, don't don't tell. And you can't. That's what I'm saying. Without without doing those releases of information. This is where, I mean, tribal communities are a little different. It wouldn't be thought anything of most tribal communities. Because, that, that, you know, somebody's always coming in with the party. They're never there by themselves. They always have some other individual there with them. Uh, so, so confidentiality isn't viewed quite the same. But for state reasons, as, as under the state umbrella, you're going to have to get releases. So if, you, if they want you to share information, about what you're doing with those extended family, not gathering information from the extended family, but sharing information with the extended family. That's that's where you have to worry about that confidentiality. And and just develop that trust that you guys have talked about even before I was um, starting my presentation. You were talking about developing that trust, and that's that's even more crucial when you have Indian families. So um, one of the things to do: ask questions. It's, it's always amazes me that um, when you at, when I've had people say, "Well, how'd you get that information?" I, th I said, "Well, I asked them." It's, it's like it's not. It doesn't take a rocket science. Ask them questions. They're, they're they're you know they may not answer you immediately, and it may be a couple of days or even a couple of weeks before they'll answer you. But ask questions. Um, don't don't think they're going to share everything with you if you don't ask the questions. Um, they have experienced. Um, some negative things happening to them historically and in, in, within their generation often of kids being removed by state agencies. And so they're not going to be as inclined to volunteer information to you as maybe some other families would. But if you ask questions, they're usually going to tell you. Um, and uh, understand who's going to be the decision maker, the true decision maker in that family. And it may be the parents, but it may not be. It may be the grandparents, it may be aunts and uncles, it may be somebody else. And you need to know who needs to be part of that decision making process in order for it to actually make, for them to be willing to make changes in their lives and to address some of the issues that are coming up that led to the removal.
And then you said, uh, part of the asking questions, I remember you said in the past, mm -hmm. ask them who's the one person right. that I should be talking to about what's... Yes, yeah, so, so this is, this is a, um, I think, an issue that frustrates the state. And I can understand because the state maybe doesn't understand how you effectively work with Indian families. So an Indian family is not going to come up and say, most of the time, they're not going to come up and say, I want to be considered as a placement for this child. That's just not the way they operate. What, what they're going to do is the family is going to make that determination. There's going to be some informal meeting or some communication among family members that they're likely to identify <coughs> Excuse me. Um, who would be an appropriate placement for that kid. And one of the best ways, I was talking to um, a, a tribal member from Blackfeet, we were talking about this, and she came up with this great suggestion that I think is just wonderful, is that what you do is you ask every family member you talk to, identify three people that you think would be a good placement for this child if we have to have a placement for this child. And when you look at the list they come up with, there's going to be one or two people that, that rise to the top on that list. But nobody has sort of stood out and hauled themselves out as, I'm such a wonderful person that I should be the person you should place this child with. So it, it's, it, it sort of conforms to that more cooperative, communal approach. But you get the information you need. So I think that's uh, one of the things that can be, you guys can be helpful with is identifying extended family or a placement for this child that meets the placement preferences here. Um, in that regards. Okay, I have five minutes left. Um, I was going to do some historical stuff, but I'd really rather see what questions you have before I um, go forward. What before you can do the soft shoe. The soft shoe? <laughs> five minutes. No. What uh, percentage of the kids we deal with are equipped kids? Any sense of that? Well, uh, you, you, you said about 30% were in foster care. 30%, it's, it's in the 30, it's more than 30%. I think it's 33. I can't remember what she said, and I, I didn't bring that piece of paper that I wrote it down on. Telling Brian that uh, Mountain Home and, and Carol Graham programs, the young the mm -hmm. moms, they're, the majority of their, their constituents are Native, are Indian. So quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably about a third of your cases probably involved Indian children. I, that would be my guess. So we get paid more for those? <laughs> Seems a lot more work. They're, they're much more rewarding. Okay, good. Yeah. And they, they, in some respects, they really can be much more rewarding. Um, could, could you just say a few words about alcohol use within the family? Sure. Family? Sh sure. Um, well, I guess how I preface that is um, substance abuse within Indian country is really no greater than it is throughout the population. The percentage is actually the same. What you see different, I think, is is the poverty conditions that go with it, which is much greater in Indian country. So when you combine those two, the effect may be different. But percentage-wise, the, the alcohol the alcoholism rate is no greater in Indian country than it is throughout the, the general population. It's that poverty issue that often comes into play coupled with the substance abuse, whether it's alcohol or meth or, or what other substance abuse, whether it's prescription drugs. Uh, so I, I think that's where you guys are seeing it is that poverty. Kind of more like a sensitivity question. I mean, you've heard us just for the past couple of hours go back between referring it as Native or Indian. Is there a general preference? So, um, y you know, the, the I guess is there a general preference. I don't think tribal people really care uh, for the most part as long as you are uh, respectful and engage with them. What you see with an Indian country, I use the term Indian because that's what the act says. That's what most of the federal statute do. Most tribal people, if you're using generic terms, use American Indian. But really what you do is use the tribe, whatever tribe they're from, if you know that. So, so it just depends on your level of knowledge about the person as to what term you might use. So if I'm working with a family, I'm going to know what tribe they're in, and I'm going to refer to them as a member of Blackfeet or Salish Kootenai or whatever tribe that they're a member of is how I'm going to refer to them. What other questions? 
Anything else you think I need to cover in two minutes here, Dennis? Okay. Okay. <laughs>